they're basically hitting you so fast that you can lose more money in half a second than you can make in a month. The good and bad of electronic trading is it makes the markets that much tighter, which is great for the rest of the world, not so good for a guy who's in the industry Family of trying business. to take that money in between, right? The XIV failed because it was built to fail. That was the dumbest product. The only way you can hedge that is with your ego because there's no way you can stay up with it. Hi, this is Tony Greer, and we're going to talk to two extra large personalities from CNBC today, Pete and John Najarian. We're going to find out how they got their start on the floor in Chicago. We're going to find out about how they founded their monster brand of financial platforms. And we're going to find out what they have planned for Investitute's future. Let's get started. So as a student of the market, this is an honor and a privilege for me <laughs> to speak with you guys, OK? <laughs> 70 years of trading experience <laughs> under your belts, accomplished authors. You're serial entrepreneurs. You've started a number of platforms and products and sold them to relevant players in the markets. Um, I think I'd like to start where you guys started and where I started, down on the floor of the exchanges and Open Outcry. Yeah. So if you would tell me a little bit about, number one, what got you down to Open Outcry, and then what was your path throughout your Open Outcry experience that led you to start starting these products? You know, do you, where, where sure. do you guys want to start talking about your well, floor life? I was down first, so I'll start. Yeah. Because everybody always asks Tony, well, are you guys twins? <laughs> right. Uh, and I always say, nope, six years apart. Right. Not um, sure if that's a flattering thing for me or not. <laughs> <laughs> flattering for me. Is it a volatile spread or does that spread look pretty much tight <laughs> to six years the whole time? Six years. Well, yeah. It looks good. You guys look good. That looks right. Um, and I came out of uh, playing football for the Bears, played four games, four uh, for the Chicago Bears, got cut. Um, I don't know why I was so surprised when I got cut. <laughs> I was surprised only because I, I played in the preseason um, and Singletary held out on his contract. Okay. He was the guy they drafted in the second round. They drafted Van Horn in the first. Both these guys started and had long pro careers and Singletary's in the Hall of Fame. Yep. But once they figured out, you know, his skill set, which was uh, immense... Um, they decided to cut me. And so, like I say, I shouldn't have been so surprised, Tony, when I heard that knock yeah. on the door, <laughs> but I was for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, but my agent gave me an opportunity. He said, do you want to come down onto the trading floor? Uh, because I said, I didn't want to go up to Canada. Um, I love Canada. I just yeah. didn't want to go up and try to play football up there. I know number one, they have a limited number of Americans on each team. Yeah. Um, number two, uh, they don't cover you at all for any uh, injuries that occur. Only the Canadians are covered. Wow. So in other words, you're going up there, you're a gladiator, you're thrown into it, making no money, because I think I would have made like, you know, 5000 a game or something like that. 5000 is not nothing right. in 1981, but it's also not what I was going to be making in the NFL. Right. And I figure if I'm going to risk getting hurt like that, um, I think I'll pass. So football was actually your connection to the exchange. It was, because my agent had uh, three traders down on the floor um, that were basically running money for him. And they were all three former pro athletes. One was hockey, one was football, one was skiing. Mm -hmm. And he'd represented them in their various contracts. So when those careers ended, he said, hey, come on down, because I'm looking for guys that have discipline. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing I think that uh, athletes in general, pro or otherwise, have to have discipline. And it's Pete's number one thing. Mine also, as far as you got to have discipline if you're going to make it in this game, because a monkey can make money uh, picking stocks. I used to have to go against a monkey every year. When oh, I, really? When I was at Fox. Back in the day. Yeah. They would bring in a monkey every year. And the monkey from the zoo, would get a dart and he'd either throw it at the dartboard and, you know, they'd have stocks on the dartboard. Right. And so I'd have to beat that monkey. Or they'd have a monkey come in and he'd crap on a newspaper. <laughs> and wherever the crap landed on the newspaper, that's the stock. Very technical had. approach they had. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. So the monkey can obviously pick stocks. Um, I'd like to say that I always beat the monkey because I did. Right. But uh, <laughs> the reason I beat the monkey, at least partially, is because... Tony, I know, just like you as a pro trader, I know when to cut my losses. Yeah. You've got to have discipline. Risk management um, skills. Yep. And if you can't cut your losses, you're not going to make it because even the monkey 
can, you know, pick a stock that goes up go 12%. Up. <laughs> uh, but can the monkey cut the losses and or does the monkey take the profits? Right. But anyway, so, so that's what got me onto the floor was my agent was uh, putting traders on the floor. Very interesting. What, what ring did you start in on what exchange? I started on the Chicago Board Option Exchange as a runner. And so I literally, you know, the, it's a euphemism. They didn't let you run, but you walked fast. Yeah. Um, from the booths at the periphery of the floor um, to wherever an order needed to go, in the middle of the floor usually, right. uh, to a broker. I couldn't execute or anything like that. I was just basically going back and forth as a runner, right. bringing right. orders from the desks at the periphery. Remember, this way before cell phones. Yep. <laughs> um, and so all, all the guys have got like, you know, the two phones to their ear, like in I Wall remember. Street with Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheehan and all that. Yeah. Pretty similar, except that was, of course, upstairs, where you did a lot of what you did, Tony. Right. And this was down on the trading floor, but same idea. Very so interesting. So that's, that's what I did was uh, basically learned what was going on for about three months. Right. And then I started taking tests and getting ready to become a trader. And then you got your badge, stepped into the ring, started trading options yep. and open outcry. Yes, sir. And when did your brother join you? Uh, so then Pete joined about... Uh, Six years later, because yeah. like I say, I'm six years older than okay. Pete. Um, so and you paved Pete, the way for him a little bit. You said, come on down, door, little brother, uh, right? Kick it through, and I really... <laughs> and he'd been trading, or not, he'd been investing, yeah. and he'd come through Chicago. I'll let him tell you about that. But yeah. Yeah. on his way, he was playing for Seattle and the Vikings and Tampa Bay. Very cool. And on his way to and from some of those gigs, he'd come by the trading floor in Chicago. Okay, so what, what struck you about the trading floor? Was it the, uh, you know, activity level, excitement level, competitiveness? Yeah. What, what, uh, All what turned you on? All of what you just said. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Absolutely everything about it. I, I was intrigued early on. I was playing um, for the Vikings, John mentioned, and eventually I was down in Tampa. And whenever I do the trip back and forth, bringing my car down for the year, um, I would stop in Chicago for a couple of days, join them on the floor and watch and be confused beyond words because it's the most confusing thing ever. It and is. I think people that have never been on the floor or, or seen it in, in person, it's it's not only confusing, but you know, you you have to understand that people are called market makers, you know, which I don't think very many people really get that. They, they think you go to the floor and you buy a stock or an option or whatever, and that's really not the case. Right. You're making the market. And that's what John had been doing. And I watched him and it's the most confusing thing you'll ever see in your life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> to watch in person, as you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, but it was intriguing. And I uh, I was lucky enough that I played in something called the World Football League. I actually did make a trip up to Canada as well. So I kind of played everywhere. Um, right. I was asked, uh, not long after I came to Chicago, I was asked to be a player coach in the Arena Football League. Okay. Which would have been cool. And I didn't do it, but Gruden's brother, younger brother, who's now the head coach of the Washington Redskins, did it. Wow. And uh, But somewhere along the way, he and I had, had crossed paths earlier too as players. Uh -huh. But um, so when I was playing in the World Football League and I, we, uh, the first year we did well and I was lucky enough to be an all world linebacker, which nice. is much better than all pro by the way. Oh great, <laughs> much better. I understand. I mean, this is the whole world. Yeah, the whole world, but, clearly. Uh, <laughs> but then, then we, um, the second year we won the whole thing okay. and I'd gotten injured. I got injured in the first year, I got injured again in the second year and I, I just decided I was almost, I'm pushing 30 years old, I gotta get a real job. Yeah. And as much as I'd love to play in the NFL, there were guys coming out of college who didn't have any injuries, and I had a, a phone book ver version of injuries. Right. So I went to Chicago. I thought it was interesting with John early on, but it was the most confusing thing. It took me a long, long time. And then once you get it, and he said this from day one, he goes, there will come a day where you're going to say, that makes sense. Yeah. And that day finally came. And I, I did the same thing as John. I went from, from runner to clerk to assistant to a trader and then eventually became the risk manager of our firm. Right, so I've done uh, a number of those jobs on the floor as well on the commodities exchanges. And I'll say that once the light bulb goes off and you learn that your liquidity is making eye contact and finding physically yeah. um, you know, where the buyers and sellers are and your other best friend is the board up there to look at, right? And now you're starting to get your sea legs on the floor and you're saying, okay, I, can, I know what's going on at least, yeah. right? Because when you first go down there, it's like literally being thrown into the center of a pinball machine and there's things going on all around you that you don't understand, like you said. So tell me, um, tell me what, you know, the, the exchanges were functioning down there. You guys had a, a functioning role. You were making markets, et cetera. 
what led you to this huge entrepreneurial run that you went on? Okay, in 2004, you sold um, Mercury to Citadel. In 2016, um, after founding Options Monster and Trading Monster, you sold that to Citadel. Uh, to E-Trade. Uh, E-trade. Oh, excuse me, to E-Trade, no, excuse me, excuse me. I repeated the same name, I apologize. Right. Sold that to E-Trade. Two massively um, impressive feats. Congratulations, first of all, I'm in awe of that. But more importantly, I want, I want to know from the places that you were sitting, what needs did you see in the market that the market was desperately calling for that you guys spotted and you looked at each other and said, hey, if we can provide this, <laughs> we've got something on our hands. You know what I mean? Like what, what, what was the light bulb moment where you said, that's it, this isn't being done right, we're going our own way with our own product and our own idea. Well, Can you speak to that? Yeah. Sure, I think what we are is uh, very close to first movers in a lot of situations. Um, we're sort of mercurial as well because we will change and go with whatever seems to be working best. And to your point uh, about when we sold the DPM, the Designated Primary Market Maker, or Specialist, when we sold that business, we didn't really have much choice. Um, we knew the whole world was going towards high-frequency trading. It wasn't what it is now, but it was going towards that. Yep. And you either had to commit tens of millions of dollars to IT spend, as well as connections, uh, and hiring a bunch of engineers and all yeah. the rest, which is what everybody else did. You know, that's what Citadel did and does. DRW did and does. Yep. You know, Jump all Trading, Virtu, all those guys. They were building that stuff at the time. And we'd, we'd be trading and we would see these much faster than we could trade trades come at us electronically. They'd pop up on this or populate on the screen and you know they're basically hitting you so fast that you can lose more money in half a second than you can make in a month. Right. So if anything about what we were doing was wrong, um, they would pick us off, as you know the yep. phrase. Yep. Um, like that. Any ARB opportunity, they would just wipe it right off the yeah, screen. Yep, if you were it. offering or bidding something that was out of line, yep. you were either wearing it, shorted it, or whatever. And you were taking it from a situation, again, back to what, what you did as well, Tony, when um, all the orders are coming in by phone. Some are coming in onto a teletype and then being carried out. You can imagine those orders are taking 30 seconds to a minute right. to get out there, to cancel them, to get a response back, that sort of thing. All of a sudden you get to where it's popping up on a computer terminal and it's saying, buy this, buy that, buy this, buy that, sell this, sell that. And yeah, they're, hap they're able to drive those bids and offers to you faster than you can respond and then you take it to the next level where they basically say, we don't need these 7,000 traders in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We just need to let the bids and offers hit Neat. in the data center in the basement or in Mawa, New Jersey or Carteret, New Jersey. Right. We'll let these orders interface with each other and that's high frequency. And again, you need tens of millions just to put down you know, the opening, uh, right. just to basically match what those guys are doing. And that doesn't mean you're going to be successful because they're continuing to develop risk. AI and all the rest. So it was a no-brainer. We had to sell. Um, luckily, we did to Citadel and Ken Griffith's firm. Mm -hmm. um, and then we started developing uh, things that we'd already had, like Heatseeker, uh, because we sold the floor trading operation. And every one of our guys but one got a job with Citadel when, when we sold yep. it. The only reason he didn't was he wouldn't take the drug test. <laughs> right. There's a shocker. So you sold the business to Citadel, who is a very high profile firm nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Was then too. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Oh they, he gosh. came on the scene and I'm telling you me more what. about it. What was it like working with them? What was it like interacting yeah. with those guys? Uh, you suddenly realize that you are meeting, you know, in our eyes, the devil. Uh, and I say that not in a negative way towards them, although it sounds like that, but I mean, they were what's crushing what was happening. I mean, the one of the biggest things that pushed us off the floor and into that, the world to actually sell our firm was the margins. I mean, the good and bad of electronic trading is it makes the markets that much tighter, yeah. which is great for the rest of the world, not so good for a guy who's in the industry Family of trying business. to take that money in between, right? right? So when you eliminate that and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and the margins are getting to the point where our overheads, we've got insurance, we've got this, the trading leases, all the things that we've got, um, 
it was impossible. So we, we could make uh, what most people would in consider incredible amounts of money per month and still lose money because of the overhead aspect of it and the lack of any margin at all for us to make money. Right. So that, that really sort of pushed us in that, in that direction. Now, that's the good thing for the public. And the, the bad thing is what we've seen over the last couple of years with algorithmic trading, where we've seen these moves where an algo is programmed to be able to hit a stock or the entire market, and we watch moves that are seven or 800 or 1,000 point moves in single days. Yeah. So there's the good and the bad side of this whole thing. But I will tell you this, first time I ever walked into the offices of Citadel, I was absolutely blown away with everything. The technology of the offices, the technology of the people within the offices of what they had that we had no clue on relative to what they were doing. And um, it was like a time machine yeah, for you, right? It's, yeah, it's like we saw, oh, yeah. and I'll tell you what, there, there's probably no other aspect of business that I can think of that went through the changes of the stock market, options market, derivatives market, all that, as fast as we did. True. I mean, we literally went from here to here so fast that uh, it's pretty incredible, actually. That's and quite... to see where we are now. And, and you know what? Here's the good news. Um, in the options market, because of what we did, and it was all manual, it was paper. I mean, I literally used to stand there, write, you write your things, and you throw them to your yeah. clerk, and this is how you trade it. Yeah. You know, you're writing them down. Sell, buy, you know, all that kind of yeah. crazy stuff and all the numbers and everything else. But um, we could only trade so many options in a day. I mean, and the one thing that, you know, eventually later on um, that I've brought up many times on television and, and in talks to people is if you look at where the volumes were when we were there and how they've changed now in terms of just this incredible growth and in 2018 record by over 3 million per day yeah. record. So I think the biggest uh, volume year we'd ever had was averaging about 18 million a day. And this past year, we were averaged about 21 million a day. That's a lot of to do with electronic trading. That never could have happened, I right. think, in the old the old world. Just the pure <laughs> shortcoming of having human traders run the operation, yeah. right? It just wasn't yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. And well, it's also when you're going against a Citadel or DRW or any of those firms, you have no idea how big they are unless you know somebody at the firm. Right. <laughs> I mean, Ken had taken over the tower from Jamie Dimon because mm -hmm. Jamie Dimon was Bank One. So the Bank One tower in Chicago, when Basically, Harrison, I think, was the CEO of JP Morgan at the time. He brings Jamie in, and it was only a matter of moments <laughs> before <laughs> Jamie got picked to be the CEO over Harrison. Right. Um, Jamie leaves, he goes to New York. I knew him because our kids went to the same school in Chicago. Uh -huh. But uh, all of a sudden, this building is filling up floor by floor. It's like a 40 story building, and mm -hmm. almost every floor is Citadel. Mm -hmm. And no one knew who they were. Yeah. And again, if you don't know who works there, right. A, you're never going to get into the building. Um, B, you're never going to even get up to where their traders are and things like that, let alone the data centers and all that. And it's anonymous. It's We're just getting hit with this stuff right. on the floor, but there's no name to it. Everybody else, when Goldman comes in, you know it. Yep. Morgan comes in. Uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank. Anybody, when they come in, you know it because they're coming through that broker. Right. Mm -hmm. With Citadel and these other guys, it's all just zeros and ones that are just <laughs> streaming at you as fast as possible. It's an electronic, just, electronic yeah. vampire squid. Ken was Batman. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> he That's really was. <laughs> so tell me how you segued. You've now parted with your business and you're starting mm -hmm. from scratch. What did you do when you started from scratch and what did you look to accomplish from there? Mm -hmm. What was your so, first product? The good news was that we went from like... Uh, 60 some odd traders um, and support staff to two. <laughs> wow. Because like I say, everybody got a job that wanted one with yeah. Citadel and Pete and I just were trading our own, on our own then okay. for collectively for us, the two of us. And we continued to use this uh, heat seeker algorithm that we developed, which is really you know how we follow the smart money. I mean, we knew it worked, Tony, in uh, 2001 before we sold the firm to Citadel, we knew this was working because um, we'd get run over, just as you remember. Yep. By run over, of course, I mean that you just have a buyer that is relentless. They're just coming in, coming in, coming in. You don't know why. And 10 minutes later, whatever the news is that was driving that buyer is on the tape and it's public. And you're like, oh my God, and now you're chasing, <laughs> trying right. to get this stuff back. Yeah. So we knew there were smarter people than us. We knew there were people that had tens of millions of dollars in commissions that they could pay 
for the best information on the street. Because we all know that's how you get that upgrade from Cowan, Goldman, Citigroup, whomever. You get that upgrade. You might even get that the analyst is leaning towards upgrading that stock the day before. I mean, you know, yeah. anybody watching understands that there are folks that get better information and get it faster. And if you can act on tomorrow's news today, you can make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, absent any other catalyst being in the market. Now, sometimes some of these trades are insider. Um, that was the case in 9-11. 9-11, we saw a huge buying of puts in American Airlines, United Airlines, three days before the towers went down. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, we thought, is somebody downgrading the airlines on Monday or Tuesday? Because they're buying short-term, relatively short-term um, puts that are uh, right at the money. Uh, and something at the money, of course, is going to react instantly to whatever news right. there is. People were selling them. Luckily, we weren't. But we saw this paper. And then, of course, when the towers come down, American and United drop to $15. And you guys These options that they're paying a dollar or $2 for go to 15 like that. And we don't trade for a week. So these guys are probably trading out of it on stock anywhere around the world that was still open when the U.S. was shut. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a staggering story. Yeah. Staggering story. So now you got the heat-seeking product, mm -hmm. right? Um, what led you to Options Monster and then, uh, you know, my, um, excuse me, Options Monster and then Trading Monster? Yeah. What was that, what was that segue like? You just kept going and, well, and digging Option in? the Option Monster idea was, hey, look, we've always felt, we still feel to this day, that there's not enough education out there about the derivatives world. Everybody's afraid of it. And because we're option traders, we used to look to, be looked at, I don't think as much anymore, but to some degree probably, that you're always the crazy guy. You're the guy with the ungodly amounts of risk on and all the rest of that because, oh my goodness, you're long and short these calls and puts and all this kind of stuff. And right. people just don't understand it. And I think their lack of understanding was something that we wanted to get out there. So we, as part of Option Monster, we started education. And on top of that, we decided, you know what, this is really cool what, what we're seeing here through the Heat Seeker. Uh, we thought that other people would want to see what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so we started that side of the business as well. And that morphed into the whole Trade Monster thing because with Trade Monster, uh, we felt like the markets were not really adequately getting the execution systems that, that we would want. And we thought other people would want. So the one thing we did uniquely versus I think everybody else was, John and I being former traders, would probably have the understanding of what's the best way to configure something and, and create something to be able to trade in the derivatives world that would make sense as opposed to some of the old line. And, and let's be honest, most of the major firms don't want everybody trading derivatives. Uh, they find it too complex. Most of their, you know, the, these guys, they've gone through the Series 7 and all the rest of it, but I don't think that they really, they, they, they absolutely have tried to hold people back, still to this day, from trading derivatives if they can. So we decided to build this and, and we did. And I think that people immediately said, wow, that makes sense. And, and with that, we gave them all kinds of different strategies that you can use that would make it a one-stop shot. One click, boom, and you could put on a position that you wanted to put on. So you guys were first movers into sort of identifying the smart money flow, creating a system to educate people as to what that meant, leading them into the trade, and sort of completing the whole round turn of how to analyze and manage that risk. Yeah. Okay, so you're, yep. you're making sort of, uh, you're helping make derivatives a little bit more of a household name and yes. a friendly item. Right, right. Very cool. <laughs> and when we, uh, when we went to pick a name for the firm, um, we picked uh, um, Trade Monster, I think, was the name that we came up with first. And then, you know, I'm doing these internet searches for, you know, well, can we, let's grab as many monsters as we can. Trade yeah. Monster. Okay, what do we need now? Stock Monster. Somebody has it. Somebody has it in Colorado. <laughs> yeah. and they're not using it. You know, they're not yeah. doing anything with it. Right. But I was afraid that since I was on Fox, because I was on Fox for 10 years, and then now CNBC for the last 10. Right. Um, so I thought, what if somebody in Colorado knows it's me that's trying to buy this? So I had Pete reach out to the guy in Colorado and make him an offer. Yeah. So we bought that domain from him. Mm -hmm. And then we bought, uh, uh, so we had Option Monster, Stock Monster, 401k Monster, um, Trade Monster. We had like 16 different monsters that we registered. But yeah. the most important were stock options and trade monster. 
We wanted those because uh, then that would kind of solidify. The others were for protection, right? Uh, but those were things that we wanted, yeah. So that when somebody thought of it, oh yeah, what's the weird name? Oh yeah, trade monster mm -hmm. or option monster or stock. Monster. Great branding mechanism. I mean, yeah. I knew what that was, and literally, I associated that with your face before I knew your name. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It was one of those things, and that's yeah. how it progressed. <laughs> So when we came up in this business, we had the opportunity to work on the exchange floor and get our sort of nuts and bolts education about liquidity and risk management. Um, in 2019, mm -hmm. now that that's not as robust a business or robust uh, uh, a trading center, where do, where do people go to get started in the business if they want to get, you know, latch on to something and build a career, um, you know, on Wall Street and they're not sure which direction to go or what place to start? What do you guys suggest for that? That's a tough one because, um, like we said, uh, there were 7,000 jobs in Chicago on the trading floor. Now I think there might be 300 traders left wow. um, because all those jobs were taken by technology. Right. Um, and the only reason that there's 300 left, it's no disrespect to the 300 that are left, uh, but uh, it's not because those are the greatest 300 traders left in Chicago. It's that they have to be there mandated by the exchange for some period of time. As okay. soon as they say, you don't have to have a trader on the floor, nobody who's running a book is gonna keep those traders there. So that's gone. Right. Um, and literally they'll be bowling alleys. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, laser tag, we say these days. Right. You know, most of these trading floors will be laser where, tag. Where areas. do we point kids coming out of college that wanna get it, uh, uh, they wanna be traders. They wanna be Wall Street traders. What, do you, what say, do you suggest? Yeah, I, I, I get that question actually a lot. Um, I, I live back in Minnesota. I've got all kinds of great kids out there who knew me when I played football and all the rest of that kind of thing. And they're looking at, hey, how do you do what you're doing? It's different, obviously, to your point, John. I mean, that what we all did doesn't doesn't really truly exist anymore. Right. But um, you know, there's there's great different entry points. I mean, investment banks still exist, of course. You know, I mean, there's private equity firms. There's, a, I think, there's venture capital. There's a lot of different areas, and you know, I think most kids who go and they have a degree in business or finance or whatever it might be, and they think they want to be a broker. Um, oftentimes we'll go and then find out that there's a different path that might be better than what they got, yeah. but at least get in the door of those kinds of places. So there, you know, it's, it's different, yeah. uh, but it's always going to be different. And it's, yeah. you know, it's the world of FinTech that we're all in. I mean, and, and we talked about the progressive, how fast we moved from this point to this point in the options world. Um, and in the stock market in terms of just how much volume and how much is really going on, how much has changed. There's still other areas that are going to be budding areas that I think that are going to be great for, for kids coming out of college. Yeah, the street is that dynamic where there's yeah. always something. Uh, there, always. There's always a hot spot yeah. where... Uh, and it's not just Silicon Valley. It's not just in New York. I mean, it's all over yeah. the place. And I think sometimes people get caught up. You know, the private equity firms, for instance, back where I am in Minnesota, you'd be shocked at how big they are, how many there are, uh, and, and and that's just Minneapolis, St. Paul. I mean, you go to Chicago, you go to, yeah. you know, you all, all around the country, and you look at some of these states that have had this huge influx of people moving to them for tax reasons and other reasons. But you know, Texas was never on the on the map at all, and now Dallas and Austin and Houston and San Antonio. I mean, there is an uh, um, unbelievable amount of potential jobs out there in, in our world in, in one shape or form, I think. Very good. So there's hope. There is hope. There's hope there's for the very youth today. Much hope. Yeah. All right. That's good to hear. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the modern volatility markets, yeah. okay? And um, I have a sort of um, a, a theory that we have permanently entered into a higher volatility regime since February of 2018, when we saw the XIV short volatility strategy blow up. Um, I've been writing to my clients and preaching that we should sort of be prepared to buy volatility on higher dips, um, a sort of um, less steep dips than we were uh, prior to February of 2018 um, with the idea that, you know, the old VIX range was somewhere around 8 to 10 when the S&P was firing along with these minuscule ranges up towards 3,000. Um, and now we've taken out that entire or a portion of that entire, um, let's call it the easy money short volatility strategy. Mm -hmm. um, we've clearly come into a much different market um, with President Trump as, uh, you know, more of a protectionist president. President, um, with the tariff wars, et cetera. 
Do you believe that we are in a permanently higher volatility regime? Do you think that we're gonna head back to the 8 bit of 10 and the S&P is gonna keep sailing along? Or do you think that we've got more episodes to stomach along the way and that XIV was the beginning of uh, uncovering the weakness in the short volatility strategy? I know that's sort of a loaded question, but I'm sure you're so capable with, uh, with some views behind it to attack that. <laughs> well, um, first of all, the XIV failed because it was built to fail. Yeah. Um, honest to God, uh, Tony, that was the dumbest product. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and to be blunt. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, I'm credit glad it's Swiss gone. and the rest of the guys that put that thing together. Um, so I, I, I mentioned this to uh, a friend, Nancy Davis, over at Quadratic. Mm. And I said, Nancy, when we saw this thing, I said then, and I continued to say through the meltdown of it, when it went to from 99 or wherever it was, to basically six yeah. in one day, you know, when it lost, you know, 90 some odd percent of its value. Um, I said, the only way you can hedge that is with your ego, because there's no way you can stay up with it. No way possible you could stay up with it. I'm not against leveraged ETFs. I know this was an ETN, an exchange traded note, mm -hmm. but I'm not against leverage with ETFs or ETNs. But something like this that's a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. What could go um, wrong? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, crazy, stupid stuff. So will there be more like that? There'll be more moves yeah. like February of 2018, yep. I think. Um, we saw one in December. Yep. It was about as ugly as I can remember going back to the 2008-2009 debacle. Totally. But we'll see more. Uh, quite frankly, we'll see more because what Pete mentioned about combination of artificial intelligence or AI and uh, high frequency trading. And it's, again, I'm not demonizing them, but uh, I would say that uh, at a very minimum, the SEC and FINRA should be fighting for putting the uptick rule back in. Right. Because the uptick rule worked for you know, whatever, 80 years yeah. from the time they put it in. Yeah. And then when they repealed it, they said, well, more or less with 40 disparate different markets, how do you know what the last uptick was? The same computers that make high frequency trading possible, make it possible to know you can't sell on that because it's right. That's a, a lower tick, tick right. than yeah. the last traded price. So you can't sell there if you don't own it. Yeah. If you own it, you can get out anytime you want. If you don't own it, you can't. Uh, just pound it into the ground. But right. like I say, when you've got artificial intelligence and algorithms that are built to, okay, every time I get hit on the bid, lower my bid and lower the quantity on my bid. Mm -hmm. So what am I doing? I'm withdrawing liquidity, right. liquidity on the side that needs it right. instead of adding, I'm, right. I'm pulling back. Right. When you were a market maker, you got special margins and all the rest for being there and guaranteeing that you would uh, make a market as the market was falling apart. Might not be a great market, but you're guaranteeing to be there. Otherwise, they'll take that uh, market maker designation away. Right. We don't have that anymore. And they could do go a long way towards dealing with it, putting the uptick rule back in And I for think securities. that's the biggest problem is the fact yeah. that, that we, we have allowed this to occur where, you know, I catch a lot of flack, so does John, because we bring this up a lot. The uptick rule being one, and the, the algorithms are not market makers. Right. When you make a market, if you have a bid, that means you absolutely have an offer available and vice versa. Yeah. And the fact that these computers are not, the AI is not allowed, they, they, they're not in those same restrictions. They are just going one direction off of one word from Jay Powell or President Trump right. or whomever. Yeah. It's one word and that's all they need and pop, 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 pop. And then that's when you get these just crazy moves. And yeah. I. You brought up, well, what do we think going forward? I would think that um, there's enough going on in the world, and we've got a pretty interesting guy sitting in the White House who, in terms of how he communicates. And because of that, um, I think that no matter who it is going forward, because of the social world that we live in and everything else, I think it's we're, we are in a more volatile space. Yeah. Now, I say that on a day where we're seeing volatility actually has come down to a reasonable level these days, but um, I've you know, always lived by the thing. John has too, the, the old uh, adage that, you know, you buy when you can, not when you have to. Mm -hmm. So there are times to protect yourself. And then there are times where you can let some of that go. And exactly. I just think the range is different than it was. Like you mentioned, there was an eight to 10, maybe even call it a eight to 12 range for quite some time. Yeah. 
And now, now I feel like we're probably in a different range. And yeah. it's it's probably something closer to a 12 to 16 under normal circumstances, but we can very easily get right back to 22, 24, 25 um, if enough different pieces of the puzzle come out. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Be 25. I couldn't yeah. agree more. And I'd love to speak a little bit. Um, you said, I don't want to demonize the high frequency traders. I want to demonize them a little bit. Okay. okay? I want to Go demonize them a little bit because yeah. like, uh, you know, like you guys, I came from a market where they did not exist yeah. and trades were consummated by looking each other in the eye and counting the badge number and looking at the time on the clock. Yep. And then those were all cleared. Now we've created uh, quite a bit of a free for all situation. And like you guys say, I mean, you clearly have the same acts that I do. And that is what is the disconnect between the SEC not noticing the distortions that they create, not noticing the underlying danger of having derivatives built on derivatives built on derivatives? <laughs> and you, you and I, you guys and I both know that we're probably in for a day of reckoning at some point, you know what I mean, with those uh, products being stacked on top of each other. What is the disconnect with the SEC? Do you think that they're just happy to see the volume trading? Do you think that uh, uh, they're looking the other way on, on a set of high frequency funds that they don't want to investigate? Or what do you think the disconnect is? Can you speak to that at all? I think it's that uh, they don't fully understand it. Right. Um, I, I think that uh, they try to look at things, you know, after an event happens, you know, like we all would. I'm Forensics. not saying, you know, that I have this clairvoyance and I can see out into the future, but they're always, you know, what do they say, fighting the last war. Um, so that's what they're looking at. So in the case of... Uh, uh, the flash crash in 2011. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it did exactly what we said. The algos were lower, withdrawing uh, liquidity right when you needed it and lowering prices. And when they all do it in concert, you know, you get just a, a sharp drop to the downside like we got. And then a very sharp rebound when the money comes back in to cover. And then some of the guys that are late to cover are now short covering and chasing that thing up Right. So you get that incredible V-shaped bottom that you had in 2011. That we just um, saw now. And so they're going to fight that war. They're going to say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a circuit breaker in. That'll do it. We're going to put a circuit <laughs> breaker in that'll stop if this, the following terms are met. Then we're going to stop. And if it happens within the last half hour of the day, then all bets are off. Right. You know, we'll just let it, I mean, let, let it, it happen. happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, without having that clairvoyance that I mentioned, since they lift most of those stops into the last few minutes of trading, I'd say that's when one of the big next things is going to happen. Yeah. So when you replay this, whenever that happens, <laughs> yeah. you'll say, boy, I think John was really right about that. <laughs> yeah. Look at this thing. It, it fell 2,000 points, you know, from 250 to 3 o'clock because there were no... Circuits yeah. to, circuit breakers to stop it. Exactly. Well, we're going to have some sort of crisis because we've got, you know, the growth of passive management has become astronomical. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the biggest funds clearly are owners of the five biggest stocks in the market, the FANG stocks, et cetera. And, you know, my biggest fear is that if they all turn south in one day, you know, in major quantities or in one week, et cetera, and having major magnitude moves lower, then there are going to be a lot of sellers and lower prices are probably going to bring out more sellers. Um, so that's my concern with the markets. Do you guys agree with that? That that's, uh, you know, the passive investing yeah. could be something that The passive leads investing, us yes. My only pushback at all is um, I realize the FANG names um, really are a lot to do with the market. But I think sometimes we have focused so much on those names and 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 I realize market cap and everything else. That I, I get it. I mean, they're, they're, they're huge movers of the S&P 500 and blah, blah, blah. But um, I still look at a lot of the other side of, well, there are Microsofts out there, there are Oracles out there, there's Intels out there, and there's and all kinds of different industrial stuff. I mean, so I, I oftentimes have pushed back at the idea that it's just FANG. I, I, I get it, I, I totally get it, but I think underneath that level of FANG, there are there are some great support areas. Yeah. And, and I, that I, I think there are many companies that are just still overlooked that, they do have their moments where they're going to have a six month run that everybody's like, oh my goodness, have you seen this? And, you know, right now we're sitting in the middle of one of those where everybody is still focused still, I think, on the fangs. But if you look at old tech right now, I, I just came up with, I think, 15 different tech names that are up over 20 plus percent this year alone. Yeah. 
So, and, and none of those are paying. Right. So, so I think that part of it is what's what's interesting is you know that 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 Fang gets a lot of uh, the publicity and they sh they should because of what has happened and how big of a portion they are. But there's other stuff out. There's other drivers. So I th yeah, I 100%. think there's a little bit more of a broad movement out there than than gets credit for. I mean. Biotech's had a great run and nobody's even talking about it. Yeah, right true. Now. They have had a great couple of weeks. I mean, it's, true. it's interesting how there's, and, and I think that's the market that we've been in for probably, what, two years? This rotational market where who's leading? Who's going to bring us next? Yeah, I mean, pharma point. names, Merck's hitting new highs, Lily's hitting new highs, and nobody talks, and nobody, you know, you look at TV, you won't see it talked about. It's yeah. not talked about because everybody said, hey, did you see Facebook? <laughs> right. And the latest thing, the investigation or whatever right. it might be that day, right. Apple, Tim Cook, whatever it is. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot going on in other places. So I think that the hottest topic in the market right now, at least from the people that I've been speaking to, is the abrupt 180 degree turnaround by our Fed chairman. OK, Jerome Powell came into office uh, with a stiff upper lip looking to raise normalized interest rates looking to reduce the balance sheet. He went on a campaign to do so, and suddenly the markets um, went into a pretty deep sell-off, and clearly the president was making his bones about what was going on and making a lot of noise. And in February, there was actually a dinner between President Trump, Steve Mnuchin, Jerome Powell, and obviously there were some marching orders given out at that I would at that <laughs> dinner, I would say at some level. So I would just love you to hear what your guys' opinion is on the 180 degree turnaround by Jerome Powell from Hawk to Total Dove, from you know four hikes next year to no hikes next. Uh, excuse me, this year, and from running off our balance sheet to not running off our balance sheet. Do you think that that creates a problem in the future, that we should expect more volatility? Or is that the Fed taking over the markets and saying, yeah, we're going to go back to business as usual, like, like before the fourth quarter of 2018, and we're going to go back to up and to the right in small quantities and very low volatility? What do you guys think? Where are we heading now that the uh, Fed chairman has turned around completely? Um, I, I've said, Tony, that uh, the Fed chairman is the driver this year, bigger than the trade. The trade issue will take most of this year if it gets resolved. It'll take most of this year to put some, you know, real uh, bones on it and to figure out, okay, which industries are doing better, which are going to do worse, and so forth. I think it'll be a positive when it happens, when the trade deal happens. And I'm one of the folks that pushes back and said it's not priced in at all. Um, maybe 10% of it's priced in. Will it move based on headlines? Yes, but look what the moves are. They're not the 800,000 point moves that we'd expect if a true deal was struck. Right. They're like 100. We get a 150 point move out of the Dow, might even bleed off that same day. That is not what I'm looking for when we do a trade deal. But on the other hand, as you say, when Powell said what he said October 3rd, which he was fine until he said, pretty darn far from neutral. Right. I'm mm -hmm. paraphrasing, but those rough words yeah. uh, were really rough on the market. The if vote. he would have just said, yeah, you know, we could be done. We're going we're gonna to be data dependent. That wouldn't have happened. You would not have had October. Right. Um, but instead, when he said, well, we're pretty darn far from neutral, everybody says, oh my God, is he really still thinking about three and four hikes yeah. in 2019? And, you know, Goldman was still believing him like, you know, a bunch of idiots, totally. even though we know they're not idiots. Totally. Um, but they were still believing him. Yeah. And Hotsius and these guys were all saying, well, you know, Three, I'm looking for three or four hikes. And I'm like, I'm not looking for any. <laughs> right. Uh, I think you guys are smoking something and so forth. So wow. Germany rolled over hard. And the German interest rates, which the, their 10-year rate was up around 75 basis points. Mm -hmm. And now it's, and since October of last year, it's gone straight down. To two basis and points. Yeah, it's down to next to negative again. Mm -hmm. um, Swiss rate, next to negative on the 10-year, is a uh, 20-year. Um, as well, which, you know, is just ludicrous, but that's where they are. It makes it really hard for, for our Fed to move rates up. So I couldn't agree more. Was it Trump that opened his eyes? No. But data um, opened his eyes. He, he didn't want to do it for Trump. I know that. And he certainly doesn't need the job. Right. Powell took the last job he had for a buck a year. <laughs> this is a guy that was a partner at Carlyle. Right. I mean, okay. I don't know the insides of what those partners get, 
but on paper, every year they got to be making 50 to 100 mil, every partner there. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're a, a senior partner at Carlisle, you're your bank is growing so big that you don't care about, oh, do I need that Fed job? Do I need this guy right. to yell at me you know, and say I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm doing? I don't think so. But <laughs> do you think now that we've got a Federal Reserve chairman that is uh, very clearly a hundred millionaire, mm -hmm. do you think that it potentially draws a little light to the fact that the Fed policy is probably number one, creating and number two, exacerbating the wealth gap the wealth divide that we're living through now, where their quantitative easing is really inflating paper assets, which are only owned predominantly by the wealthy people in the world, whereby those that don't own the assets are now just experiencing a dilution of their currency and sort of hidden inflation. You know, that's my big question is, is that ever gonna come out? And, and are people really gonna pounce on that and expose it to the point where QE4 becomes something that's not socially or politically accepted because people are aware of what it's creating. So I just wonder if you guys think that we'll get to a point like that and what you think for the next year, but you made it clear that you think that uh, it's really going to be, it's, it's going to be a Jerome Powell year no matter what. Yep. And we're going to be Jerome watching Powell, every move yeah, now. Jerome Powell year. And, and I think, um, you know, I think he learned a really big lesson on kind of going off script. I mean, the president's gone off script many times <laughs> and I, hopefully one day he's learning something too, because when these guys get up there, people are hanging on every single word. And yeah. we know that through every Fed, Fed chair that's been around since I got into the market. I mean, they look at the size of the briefcase back in the day, and they, they, but, but it's about the words, you know, that, that are spoken. And I think Powell um, realized that he sort of maybe got in front of himself too far. And now the backtracking was a huge move. I mean, the, and people say it's the Fed put. I don't know if I'd call it even the Fed put. I would just say that the fact that he, he used the right terminology to say, hey, look, we are going to go forward and it's going to be data dependent and he stayed on point. That's when the market seemed to just say, all right, we can breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's it is not the big concern that that it was. And that's why that got pushed back. And to John's point, it's why these the trade is now, you know, front and center. It's yep. been front and center, but it was sort of, I think, sort of, I, I, it sounded like, John, you were you were more leaning towards, well, it's more Fed, and I agree that it's a lot Fed, but I think both those two elements are really the volatility and the movement of what oh, we're yeah. going to see well, in the market. And I'm agreeing with Pete yeah. on the trade side. Yeah. I just say this year, this year it'll yeah. be more Fed. Um, next year, let's say that we come to some sort of agreement. Well, let's say that Xi Jinping and the president do have a meeting at Mar-a-Lago in April now. Mm -hmm. Fine. Obviously, they don't come walking out with a sign anything, right. but they come out shaking hands happy and all that kind of stuff. And then Lighthizer and uh, Mnuchin and the rest of them, uh, Larry Kudlow, go to work trying to get to a deal. Maybe that deal happens in the fall, maybe not. Um, but when it finally happens, then it's going to be a significant driver. Yeah. And I think it's 1,000 to 2,000 points in the Dow. Not in a day, but as it plays out. Right. Um, even if it doesn't fully address the intellectual property theft or things like that, just the absence of uh, tariffs, uh, rat, roll them back yeah. on both sides, yep. them against us, us against them. But again, I've, I've said this one before, Tony, and another one I really believe is that Xi Jinping is the president for life, right? Yep. <laughs> According to whatever what we read. <laughs> to himself. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> be careful wishing for being that for life. Yeah. Because your life can end like that. <laughs> and if if they had another year where their markets are down 27% and factories are closing and you've got to address their housing issues and all the rest, and you can't just throw another 200 billion at tax cuts and all the rest, he is dead like that. Yeah. You know, he's dead faster than the Valentine flowers. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> um, I think he's too smart a guy for that. And I think that's why they both need a deal. People always say, well, Trump needs a win more than anybody else. No, no, no. Trump's market wasn't down 27% last year. That's it. Year. That's and, it. And, and you didn't <laughs> lose millions of jobs that Xi Jinping lost. Right. Um, he needs a deal and he will cut a deal. Um, but I think it's, you know, affects us in 2020.
not 2019. I agree. The, me the media doesn't cover it properly. I agree that uh, that President Trump looks like he's had Xi Jinping over quite a barrel for the mm -hmm. last several months. And like you said, you know, when you look at the, for example, the tech stocks in China back off 25%, yep. I mean, that's the scorecard right there, you know. And then if you look at it now in the data, China's data is still probably weakening, right, due mm -hmm. to the tariffs. And U.S. data has been sort of hanging in there fairly strongly. So if you look at me, that's another tale of the tape right there where... Trump doesn't need a win on that. I think he's got the win locked up. He's just got to run the clock out to the end of the game. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah. I like to start a lot of these root questions from the trading floors, mm -hmm. right? Because it invokes, uh, it invokes a very particular set of experiences, a set of stimuli around you, a set of memories, like it does for me, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. What sort of lessons have you, have you kept with you that are still applicable in today's markets that you very you know very much in your heart of hearts, you're like, yeah, that's a floor lesson that I'm never gonna let go of. <laughs> Does anything like that resonate with you where in today's markets, whether you're going to make a trade, get out of a trade, uh, cut a loss or something like that, are there sort of, uh, you know, bells of the exchange still ringing in your head or is it things that you've learned in the last six months, you know? Tell me about that, what do you guys think? <laughs> I'm going to let Pete tell the discipline story because uh, Pete does a great job describing that. Okay. And I could do it, but I'd be stealing his thunder. That's okay. what, what I will describe, though, is uh, that uh, ego is a huge issue. And you and I know, Tony, yeah. as well as Pete, that when you're down on a floor, the last thing you want to do is take that loss when there are 50 or 80 other men and women <laughs> in the ring with you, right? Yeah. You just said, buy them! Yeah. And, and you just bought a bunch of them and everybody's going, salt, 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 right, salt! Right, right. And you're saying, buy them, buy them, buy them! Right. You got any more? Right. And you know, you're, you're buying them. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden the thing turns and everybody goes, hey, Tony! Yeah. Tony, how's that trade working out? And you're just going, mother! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and you want to kill them. Right. <laughs> and you don't want to puke in front of them. Right. Yeah, and you don't want to yep. throw yeah. up in front of them. Right. Um, but... You need to take that loss. Um, so ego is a big problem. Yeah. Um, and believe it or not, and we, we all know it's 95% men on the floor, 5% women, maybe. Yeah. Upstairs, different ratio. But men have a problem with ego. Um, I do. I think every man has some sort of problem with ego. And you don't want to take that loss mm -hmm. when you know it's the right thing to do. Right. So that, that core trading <clears throat> axiom. Yeah. You learned on the floor and you carry with you to this day. What? Yeah. Tell me the story. Well, it's not even necessarily a story, but uh, I mean, I have plenty of stories. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned on the floor was, and one of the reasons that I think John and I, when we, we started working together, um, and let's say after the first couple of years, so 1995 or something like that, um, we basically looked at people and wanted to have people that have had their egos crushed in their lifetime. Those are the guys we wanted. Yeah. So uh, we literally had primarily people who had been in something competitive, whether uh, so. So most of the trading floor had people that maybe went to Penn, Harvard, Yale, whatever, and they were great students and everything. And nothing against those people. <laughs> we wanted guys who might have gone to Michigan or Minnesota or Wisconsin or whatever school. But maybe they played, and I don't care what level. It, it could have been the chess team. It could have been the football team. It could have been the hockey team, whatever it was. You know that they've had their egos chopped, and right. you know that they've had strong egos at some point in their life, and they've they've seen the highs and lows of everything. And if they could survive that, that's the guys we wanted. Yeah. Um, and if they could at least be smart enough to understand enough about the numbers, and then still had that ability to, like John said, everybody has an ego. But if you if you understand at least how to contain it, um, that's the key. And so one of the things that I've been preaching for a long, long time has been. We call it DDA, discipline dictates action. And so what does that really mean? Well, when you go into it, there's not one trade, uh, trade, some investments may be a little bit different, but trade or investment, let's just say both, I guess. Um, when you go in, you already have a price point. So when John makes a trade, the second he puts it on, he already knows where will I cut my losses and where am I gonna start yeah. thinking about my gains and when am I gonna start trimming into that or selling it. Right. Um, I think the people who do that, and, and it's worked so well for uh, ourselves, the guys who subscribe to what we do on the on our new stuff that we're working on, Investitute. Um, they see it too, and it works. I mean, you know what? The key is, you know, you're going to have losses. Everybody knows that. And even if you have decent percentage of, of the trades or losses, if you cut those losses, but then have the ability to kind of trim and trade into those gains, 
it's amazing what the returns actually can be. Right. So that's the kind of thing that we really uh, focus on. You know, every single. I know today I put on trades today. I know exactly what I'm going to get out. Right. I, I, I have, and there are certain trades that I'll put on where I won't put it on unless there is a certain risk reward level of what I'm putting on. Yeah. So I try to stick to that discipline. And I do the last two or three years. I've really done well with that one, which is, Hey, look, I'm not going to put on a, a spread in, in an option play that I can't get at least four to one on. I just won't put it on because yeah. I want a four to one win win rate on that totally. thing potential. So those are the kinds of little things, just little things like that. And people, everybody has their own. Yeah. But um, John and I both, I think, have done a really uh, a better and better and better job. You're always getting trying to get better. That's something that we both work on all the time. Is like stick to that discipline every single yeah. time. Yeah. I love to go through the motions of actually proving out that it is those basic tenets of competition of discipline, of, you know, ego management, of, you know, <laughs> learning how to abandon that and saying, I need to be smart for my own survival, yeah. you know, that, that allows us to continue to do this over the years. And I guess I just like to flesh it out with guys that have been down on the floor mm -hmm. to, to see if, uh, you know, that's really what they've taken with them from now. Right. So I guess, yeah. I mean, by the way, we, we always say, Tony, you can't eat like a bird and shit like an elephant. <laughs> right. So that's meaning, great. of course, that if you're taking 50 cent gains on, let's say you're scalping stocks and you're taking 50 cent gains, you can't take a $4 loss. You can't get blown out, right? So, you know, because that wipes out a bunch of your best gains. Right. Um, so to not crap like an elephant, you got to have something, some discipline. The nice thing about options is they provide that. Yeah. So I can get in there and buy a $2 option. I know that's my whole loss. Yeah. If, I, if it falls to a $1 option, I'm going to cut that whole position right? because I'm going to say, okay, I lost 50% on an option, not on a stock right. trade, on an option. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to cut it. And on the other hand, if it goes from two and now it's trading three, I'm looking at lightening up, starting to trim. When it doubles, if I'm lucky enough that it doubles, I pull off half the position, minimum 50%. Right. Because again, back to the monkey yeah. <laughs> analogy, a monkey can pick stocks, but a monkey's not going to be disciplined about pulling winners off the table and cutting losers. Oh, so if I have price targets to take off my winners when I get to those levels, like Pete was just saying, I know I'm going to be at the table a long time. Yeah. Nobody really likes it when we talk about um, managing uh, trading is a lot like being at the tables in Vegas, but it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it just try going to a table and playing blackjack with no discipline. Hundred percent. Um, you know, and in the movies, somebody's gonna put the you know all their money on black, yeah, and then they're gonna let it ride, and then right. come on another, let it all ride. <laughs> right. The stack is huge. Let it ride. Right. Nobody does that. No, I like it. <laughs> you I totally get blown out. <laughs> yep. No, I totally identify with that. I, I totally identify with that because, as you know, in Vegas, it's about being at the table at the right time, right? Mm -hmm. And when I play blackjack, True. I like to survive. I, <laughs> yeah. I sit down with the intention of saying, I'm going to be here for 12 hours right. because for 15 minutes, the dealer is going to be breaking left and right, and that's when you have to be there. Yeah. But I just like to see that you guys apply, um, you know, you take the emotion out. You yeah. take the emotion out by having a game plan going in. And what's what's cool is that we could have been talking about widgets, Twitter, the S&P, bond volatility or anything. Thing. And you know, it sounds like John in your head, when you buy two dollar options, you cut it at one dollar, and you start. To, you know, that's yeah. that's just a uh, that's a great tactical premise to live off as a trader, because obviously that's why you're here doing it for this long, as long as you've been doing it, right? And the last thing I'd say is you never marry a position; you only marry your wife. That's for right? damn sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that much we learned. That much <laughs> right? we learned. Yep, sure. You can't fall in love with anything, even no. Apple. As much as I love it and I own it, blah 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 blah. If if something specific were to happen, I'll give you a great example, Steve Wynn. Damn. One of my favorite investors of all time, one of the greatest entrepreneurs ever in the United States ever. And uh, when he stepped away from Win, I stepped away from the stock. And it's because you know what? They're, they're, you know what? I, it's just different now. Yeah. And you got to know who's really running the ship on on some of these things. But great you can't point. ever marry any position. That's any. a great point. I agree. I agree. There's always going to come a time when it's going to be the wrong one if you marry it. You know, the way history <laughs> yeah. has told us about that. You know, bad divorces. So, yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> so let's think about this. One last question: What's your next move? What's the next? Uh, what's on your agenda items? Are there anything you could talk about here that you're planning, working on, or uh, um, you know, share knock, with us? Knock on wood again. We're uh, we're lucky enough that. We've had three best-selling books. Awesome. We've got a fourth out now. We were just at the Traders Expo and we had a line out the door for book signing. Awesome. Literally out the door. So cool. Um, and that book is uh, 
uh, how to follow the smart money. And that will drive a lot of what we're doing going forward with expanding Investitute, because we've got modules for showing folks uh, from a beginning stock trader to technical analysis to beginning option trader all the way through. And, you know, mentors, coaches, everything. Fabulous. So we're really building up Investitute to be a big deal yeah. Yeah. Um, in financial tech. And uh, what branches off from that, uh, you know, uh, we'll I think see. you can imagine, but <laughs> yeah. that's no, what we're focused on. I like very much what you're doing. You're sort of, uh, you know, we're turning the old Wall Street inside out and we're giving, you know, mom and pop at home a look at, you know, how institutional traders trade and how big time money managers manage risk um, and sort of sharing some of the, I don't know, secret sauce of the industry, if you will. And I guess that's what we're trying to accomplish at Real Vision too. Yeah, so um, I think that's probably the attitude that we need to take in order to be, uh, you know, fighting in this market for another hundred years yeah. kind of thing, right? Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Tony. I can't thank you guys thank enough you, for taking the time today. That was great. You're the man. Yeah. Thanks right, very brother. much, guys. You, thank you, John. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. That was awesome. Well, that was certainly an exciting conversation to have with the Nigerian brothers. It was great to hear about their entrepreneurial efforts, um, how they founded their companies, and how they plan on addressing changes in the markets. For Real Vision and for TG Macro, this is Tony Greer.